Thank you, Anna. Um, our next presentation um, is titled Grounded in Data, Growing Over Time, Update on a Long-Term Student Analytics Study. And our presenters are uh, Maya Hopscheid, John Jeffries, and Mary O'Kelly. Um, so we can see their screen share here, and I think I will just let them go ahead. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Angie. John is going to navigate for us. I will get us started with the first couple slides. I'm Mary O'Kelly. Currently, I'm the Associate Dean at Western Michigan University Libraries. But when this project started, I was the head of instructional services at GVSU, which is why I am with my excellent colleagues from GVSU, Maya Hubscheid and John Jeffries, to talk about not only the project that we started uh, nine years ago now, but they're going to give an update on how this project is influencing the current activities within their instruction program, but also how it's moving the whole instruction program. And in fact, uh, everything that trickles through the libraries with the instruction and reference and consultations and research services moving throughout for those future implications. So to get started on the history and the foundation of this project that we did, Back in 2012, we started a multi-year longitudinal study that has moved all the way through the 2021 academic year. It was a quantitative analysis of student re-enrollment. And what my, we mean by that is what happens when a student has library instruction with a librarian, and then do they re-enroll the following fall? So we started with a null hypothesis. This is more of a strict uh, scientific study quantitative analysis, longitudinal. Our null hypothesis was that there was no relationship between library instruction and student retention. So starting back in 2012, we were standardizing data collection of instruction sessions, course code, course number, section number, and professor name. What's unique about this analytic study, however, is we never collected any student-specific data. We didn't ask students to sign a check-in form. We didn't even take enrollment um, information or attendance information. Instead, we developed a really close relationship with the Institutional Analysis Department at Grand Valley, um, often called the Institutional Research Department at other schools, so that they could securely acquire the data from banner enrollment, since we did have the specific course and section number. And then they would correlate that enrollment information against the instruction information that the librarians had provided in our data collection. So the whole point of this was that we were asking ourselves a lot of questions about whether or not library instruction is effective and what effective means. And is there some measurable, tangible way that effectiveness can be measured? And so the measure that we chose was re-enrollment. This is a factor of retention from one year of enrollment to re-enrolling the following fall. This is separate from persistence to graduation, which is a different measure. So um, John, if you could go to the next slide. What we found is that over all of these past academic years, uh, we are have uh, eight complete years analyzed um, and they do have the data uh, coming up soon for the ninth year that um, the fantastic analyst in the institutional analysis department uh, will be working on with them. So here's what we looked at. I, I wanted everyone to just get a sense of this. We have presented and written on this before, but just as an overview of this, in case this is your first time seeing this project, is we separated those courses that did not have a librarian in class and those courses that did have a librarian in class. So if the answer was no, we know from that enrollment data that during the 2012-2013 year, there were 8,762 students who were enrolled at Grand Valley who took courses who never saw a librarian in class, not once the whole year. Of those students, 70.9% were held over into the following fall, they did come back and re-enroll. For those classes that did have a librarian in class, which was 8,700 students. So what you see is from year to year, we typically had an N of over 16,000 consistently every year, which does make these uh, statistics highly reliable. Um, we saw a percent retention of 73.7. Now, in that small of a margin, we know that that could be 
due to some kind of um, coincidental factor, um, it may not even be significant. It could be that due to some of the other controlling factors that we looked at that that might not even be a correlation there. However, we set the p-value at 0.005. We actually tested it all the way down to 0.0001. We also did an odds ratio calculation using a regression analysis. Any odds ratio greater than one shows that yes, there is a significant correlation. So this table shows that as you go through year by year, the percent of students who had library instruction were retained at a higher rate. The odds ratio is positive over one. The p-value can be tested all the way down to 0 0.0001. I know p-value can be difficult, but it is a measure that we have when we add it into all these other measures. We are very confident saying that yes, there is a statistically significant positive correlation between library instruction and student retention the following fall. Next slide. So we have disproven the null hypothesis. In-person library instruction, now this is important later, um, John and Maya will cover that part, is correlated with that uh, re-enrollment information, but we're not clear what's actually causing it. Um, we actually think it might be a faculty effect. There was a different uh, calculation that we did that looked at faculty who talked to a librarian about instruction, whether or not the students actually met with the librarian, but they reached out, um, actually also had a high correlation of returning students. And in fact, the odds ratio is higher, meaning the correlation is stronger. So something really interesting is happening here. We think it's that faculty who connect students with high impact practices have more successful students who feel connected to the university and stay. We suspect that possibly faculty who use the library as one of those support services is itself a high impact practice that is positively affecting student re-enrollment. We don't know that yet. That's the supposition. All we know is there's a really nice correlation. John? I'm going to continue. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's a nice, smooth transition. Um, so I'm going to uh, discuss the current practices and impacts of this project. Um, so first one is that we've really been able to look at the programmatic trends and look at how that can help impact our outreach. So uh, we've seen trends in library involvement with courses and programs over time. And this has been particularly helpful in tracking those patterns and changes to both better support the evolving needs of these programs, but also to um, kind of support or mitigate the impact on the library. So in such as ensuring that we can have an equitable distribution of work as those changes happen. We've also been able to identify which programs we aren't reaching for targeted outreach. Um, we also use it for intentionally integrating information literacy into the curriculum. Because we can see the number of students we reach through library instruction at each grade level, we can work to identify information literacy objectives connected to each year in order to incorporate um, interventions more systematically into the curriculum by covering introductory concepts in earlier years and then scaffolding higher level concepts into upper level courses. Liaison librarians have also used the data um, when they write and revise the curriculum maps for their disciplines. And they are able to pull specific numbers for how many students they support in each program and grade level. Um, they can also identify the gaps in the programs and courses that don't reach um, and that helps them create more strategic plans for customized future outreach. I also want to note that this project and the data we get from it is one prong of how we assess our instruction program and it really has helped to better inform our more recent student learning assessment efforts and it helps to tell a holistic story of our instruction, which has been really valuable. We've also used it um, to track space utilization um, by monitoring the use of our library instruction labs. So we can see how often instruction occurs in the library compared to other instructional spaces on campus outside the library. We can also track the percentage of online instruction sessions, um, which I imagine will be very high for this year. Um, and so from this data, we can develop a more evidence-based rationale for 
potential um, funding or refurbishment requests. And it also shows the need for maintaining our current instructional spaces. So as I alluded to earlier, we have used the data to report out on the impact of the library instruction program to both library and campus administration. We can demonstrate the value of the program, in particular, the consistent correlation between library instruction and student retention, as well as the overall reach of the library instruction program. Um, and then finally, we do periodically review and revise the questions that we send to institutional analysis. And this is really just to ensure that they still accurately reflect what we hope to learn about our instruction program. So in particular, these reviews have led to changes in the data we collect for mode of instruction. So that accounts for more of our increases in online and asynchronous instruction over the years. So I'm now going to turn it over to John. Uh, so what we're thinking about going into the future, some of it, uh, I think Mary and Maya have both touched on in their parts of the presentation, but as library instruction changes, we need to make sure that the questions that we ask are also changing. This year is gonna be the first year where we're asking, is there a difference in um, synchronous versus asynchronous library integration? Um, is there a difference between online and in-person? Uh, we're working to complement these, qu these qualitative findings with quantitative findings, quantitative with qualitative, sorry, we want to capture stories, um, get student impact statements, and really be able to tell the impact that the work uh, we're doing has on campus. Um, we're beginning to look at how we can assess re research consultations as part of library instruction. Don't know if we're going to tie it into this methodology, but um, it's going to be a part of that overall assessment plan. We need to make sure that any questions we ask align with university priorities, key performance indicators. We know right now student retention is one of the, the key ones, um, but if there are other things that we can gather from this information to support key performance indicators, we'll just want to keep an eye out for that. Um, it allows us to do regular engagement with the overall liaison portfolio. So if the liaison job description were to change drastically, we'd probably need to look at the questions that we ask here as well. Um, right now we're going through a programmatic review of all the different components of liaison work and there may be changes to the questions that we have to do based on that and finally as mary alluded to there are other research opportunities that um, are available for this type of question what is that um, special sauce that's happening that's causing the um, retention impact is that faculty interest really the, the high impact practice um, and it, potentially moving from a correlational to see if we can identify what is that causation factor. And that is it. There's our contact information. If you want to follow up, you're more than welcome to reach out to any of the three of us. Thank you, John and Maya and Mary. Um, I don't know if, if you all got a chance to see um, the recent email from Heather, they're pushing back the time of the, um, since there was a technical difficulty, the session technically goes until 4.15, and then the next session starts at 4.45. So um, we have plenty of time for questions, or if any of our presenters want to like, you know, jump back in and mention something that they left out because they were in a rush, um, we can do that, but please, um, Mention your questions that you have for the presenters now. Again, feel free to put them in the chat or to raise your hand or to just um, alert them out and uh, we can have a little discussion. And and after um, we can, if there's not a ton for our second presenters, I'm sure Anna would be open to answering questions as well. Um, so it looks like somebody's asking what other variables did you include in your regression analysis? Hi, yes, uh, Jason, I believe, is asking that question. Uh, what we, the regression analysis um, was strictly the, the regression analysis in order to get to the odds ratio was strictly between uh, how strong is the relationship between the one um, factor of student enrollment and um, the other factor of did they participate in the library instruction session, but in order to control for the entire calculation that we did for correlation analysis 
uh, we actually did control for um, a lot of different demographics. Uh, for example, we controlled for um, first year student, we controlled for high school GPA, we controlled for um, socioeconomic status as, as uh, communicated at the time of the student enrollment and, and con, um, has to do with a lot of uh, student um, funding, financial aid. Um, a lot of trying to think of all the different um, demographics that we controlled for. What we found is that when you control for first time in any college, um, GPA, high school test scores, um, socioeconomic, um, gender and year in school, um, the correlation holds regardless of any of those factors. Um, also because our N was so high, the differences between those different numbers are very small. Um, and so we were able to come up with that very confident um, analysis of that correlation and then come up with that positive odds ratio. And then it looks like we got a, another question asking about the decision to focus on re-enrollment versus graduation or other things such as grades. Um, Mary, since you were the one who originated this, do you wanna talk about the decision at that point? And if people are interested, we could talk about why we still focus on re-enrollment. Primarily, it has to do with uh, student motivation factors. Um, by focusing on entire classes that meet with a student librarian, we're removing the intrinsic motivation factor that students who tend to do well already are coming to the library to study or are using library resources or are actively engaged in their research projects. And there's a lot of research that already proves that. So the thing about grades is because there's no intrinsic student factor, we couldn't drill down and look at grades within though each of those courses because this is the entire student body population we're looking at. So GPA would not be correlated at all because it's the entire class and you can assume that a professor who brings an entire class to the library has the same grading standards. So it's, it's quite different than that intrinsic motivation piece where students who choose to come to the library tend to have higher GPAs. It's a, it's a different kind of analysis. Regarding persistence to graduation, um, in the beginning, it was because we didn't have enough data. Um, we needed at least five years of data in order to say um, over a period of five years, are students graduating within a certain time period? Um, and it's only been in the past couple of years that we've passed that threshold of having a solid five to six years of data to go back and look at persistence to graduation. Um, so then John, if you've got anything to add about why you have, have or have not added that in. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think we haven't added it in because we just didn't think about it. So um, I appreciate the comment and we'll definitely, next time we have our debrief about questions we should add, I think this is one that um, we'll keep in our back pocket. But that re-enrollment is also, is one of the key performance indicators right now that all academic colleges at Grand Valley have to report out to um, Central University Administration. What are you doing to support retention? So it's, I, every day, I, every time I meet with Mary, I thank her um, for the forethought that she put into the work because it, it makes um, the job that Maya and I have to do now so much easier. And I would just add that there, now that we've been doing it for so many years, there's so much value in having the um, consistent data, um, but I will second John and say that's a great question. I think we will probably consider post pandemic. Uh, we also, I also did get a comment from uh, Debbie Morrow, who also is at Grand Valley, who was there with me at the time we created this, and she reminds me that at the time, um, there was a greater presence in first year writing, so uh, the actual impetus that started this whole thing was a question of um, how many students do we reach through uh, the Writing 150 or Freshman Writing Program. Uh, at the time, the campus assumption was, well, we don't need librarians to come in because they're all getting it through Writing 150. Our first analysis um, actually found that no, uh, because of testing out and AP and um, lower level courses that we only were reaching about 30 to 32 to 34 percent of freshmen via writing 150. Um, so then we started looking at that freshman to sophomore re-enrollment and it just expanded into every year re-enrollment student to fall. Thanks Debbie for reminding me of that. Any other questions for these three presenters or for Anna about her um, involvement with the WISE program? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Brian. Um, Go ahead. Okay. I figured we can jump in, you said. So uh, this is actually for Anna. Um, 
forgive me if you already kind of stated this, but um, uh, you're talking about the pipeline. I remember that. And you said maybe that's kind of a unfair um, <clears throat> analogy. Is So it sounded like the, the big thing is you're talking about kind of the inequality of the outcome of a lot, a lot less um, females than males in STEM. And, um, and then you're saying there's, I think one of the things, again, forgive me if I'm muddling it a little, but um, I think one of the things was, oh, I should get my video on too, I just realized. Um, okay, sorry. Um, and then one of the things was um, that some of the participants were saying it would be helpful to clarify the why behind that uh, disparity, if I recall. And I didn't, I don't remember if you kind of got into it or are you kind of assuming that the why is a negative thing, um, if you will, like, or there are multiple factors or, you know, is it like inequality of opportunity versus outcome? Um, I guess I'm just more curious on the, like how much are, are you assuming or is being assumed in this is a problem that has to be fixed because just because of the outcome or are there other things along that line that you're saying, no, we know this is happening and this is happening, this is happening along that line? That sure. Um, so I think what you're responding to, one is my why why slide, which is uh, why are colleges developing these sorts of groups? And so that's really what that was in response to is thinking about why do colleges feel the need to have these groups? And that is one of those reasons is because of the leaky pipeline. Um, my work has been specifically responding to their desires. That bullet point that you mentioned about clarity around their challenges or barriers or stereotypes. Um, oftentimes, it, what that meant for them, at least in my context with them, was just wanting to talk about it. They wanted to talk about the struggles they felt that they were facing, um, and they wanted to hear about the struggles that their mentors were facing. So I won't necessarily say that I'm diving into how do we fix this overall issue of, if, if it is indeed an issue, yeah. of the number or percentage of women versus male identifying people in certain disciplines. I will say that the students themselves express concern around those things. Um, so it may be something that I want to work more closely with WISE in the future. But at this point, um, my immediate need is just providing them with whatever academic and um, other kinds of programming support that they need. Mm, so mm. I wouldn't say that I'm qualified at this point to say, here's why the leaky pipeline is happening, right? Okay. But what I do know is that the students that I've been working with are requesting additional support in these various areas. One of those areas being, we wanna talk about the challenges we feel like we're facing. Sure. So uh, that's about as much I think as I can speak to it at this point. I think that the WISE group themselves are doing more research um, and following their graduates and what happens to them after, uh, after okay. school and after they graduate. Um, and what, what all we know is, all I, all I know is the numbers, right? I know what it looks like. I can't say that I know why. I do know that I can ask them what they feel like they need and then attempt to support that. Okay. Does that answer so your question? Yeah, I, yeah, it sounded like it's very student driven in terms of the students are kind of saying this, they're hoping for this and you're coming to meet that need. Is that what you're Yep, absolutely. At some point it might be on a grander scale, but at this point I have this one population sure. um, and this one drive to support them and whatever it is they feel like they need so that if they decide to leave STEM afterwards, it's not going to be because they didn't get the academic support sure. from the library. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Any further questions for our presenters? Okay, so thank you all and thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. Um, I want to remind you that on the um, conference portal, there is a tab that says event surveys and you should be able to navigate to this particular session and um, give, any feed, give a little feedback or some an assessment. I haven't looked at it yet to see exactly what it looks like, but please um, take a second to do that. And um, if there's no more questions, I will stop our recording and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everybody.